technology. I am Gemma, I'm your chair for this panel today, um, and I must start by sending some apologies. Unfortunately, Dr. Marilyn Comrie of the Blair Project and Professor Gillian Enable from the University of Leeds have been unable to join us today, I'm afraid, but we still have three excellent panelists for you. Please do get your questions ready for them. We've got some uh, opening remarks to get the discussion started. I've got some questions to get conversation flowing, and then we'll throw it open to the floor. So, first of all, Mayor Jamie Driscoll, North of Tyne. Thank you very much, Jenna. Hi, Jamie. Um, well, it's good actually be in person for a meeting because I can do this. I can say, stick your hands up if you've seen the film Titanic. Excellent. Um, so you're going to actually get the references then. Now, some people think Titanic is a story of, of love, the story of Rose and Jack, the story of women's emancipation. All those things are in there. But it's also a story of how the rich people's perspective changed what happened. It's a story about the poor people dying. It's a story about hubris over nature, the very idea that you could have an unsinkable ship. And it's a story about denial. And there's one scene in particular in Titanic, and you might remember it. So it's just after the iceberg's been hit. And uh, the engineer walks in with all the plans under his arms, and he rolls them out on the table. And uh, the captain's saying, what's happened? He says, look, we've been hit here, here, here. Five compartments of water's coming in. The guy who owns the ship's saying, um, well, it's unsinkable. This is impossible. And he turns to him and he says, it's a mathematical certainty. And this is relevant when we talk about decarbonisation. The laws of nature are in command in here. It's not about the laws of humans. So a net zero target of 2050 may be legally enforceable. But the molecules of carbon dioxide interacting with infrared light are not aware of that fact and are not persuadable by that fact. So it's delivery that counts. We've seen changes. Uh, only a few years ago, the target was to reduce emissions by 80% by 2050. Now it's net zero by 2050. And once more people grasp that mathematical certainty, these targets are going to change again. We're seeing floods now at 1.2 degrees. The, the target from Paris is a 1.5 degree rising above pre-industrial temperatures. But the constituent targets, when you add all up from the Paris Agreement, they are total between 3.2 and 3.7 degrees of warming. And that's enough to destroy crop production across India, Bangladesh, China, but also Spain, Italy, and the southern US. So rich Western nations will be affected by that. And this comes back to the Titanic analogy. There aren't enough lifeboats for everybody. We've got to make sure we don't hit that iceberg, and we are really, really close. So that answers the first question, is this important? And it's interesting when we talk about the Transport for the North decarbonisation plan. Um, back to the, the Titanic analogy again. The guys in the boiler room do fantastic work, because if you remember the film, when they say, right, we need to slam it into reverse, we're going to do it, everyone played their part. And the draft decarbonisation plan is very good. It's full of stats. Everyone loves a graph. I don't know if you've read it. It's a wonderfully colourful document, very easy to read, despite the complexity of the information that's in it. And the immediate trajectory on there, it's not just, are we going to hit net zero by 2045, which is what the plan is. It's about how quickly you get them down on the way there. So that plan is... 55% reduction by 2030, 95% reduction by 2040. Well, that would be real. It still may not be enough. It's based on the four scenarios. They're just about managing. And that's the scenario without any political direction. Things will get a bit better, but not nearly good enough. The prioritized places. With everywhere getting some investments, the priority being economic development. The digitally distributed, where you're kind of relying on technology to get us through and the urban carbon zero with a strong policy direction to get us to zero emissions as soon as possible. But in my opinion, in all of them, car use is too high. On the basis of trips made, the just about managing is a 6% increase. The um, prioritized places is 1% increase. The digitally distributed is an 8% increase. And only under urban carbon zero do we see a decrease, and that's only 6%. 
Electric cars, yes, they have zero tailpipe emissions, but they don't have zero emissions. The embodied carbon in one of these things, over its life cycle, translates to 65 grams per kilogram. And that's about a quarter of an industrial, uh, the, an internal combustion engine. Eight million cars in the north, that's, we've got to get down to a lot lower than eight million cars. And the thermodynamics, and I can speak because I might not be a professor, but I am a, a, got a degree in engineering. And you cannot thermodynamically square the idea of a, a, an 80 kilo human taking a 1600 ki kilo vehicle with them wherever they want to go. We need to be getting past cars. We need to be thinking about a mindset where transport isn't improved because you're no longer sitting in a noisy vehicle, you're sitting in a quiet, ve quiet vehicle with leather seats and air conditioning in a traffic jam. No, we need to rethink movement and connectivity overall. And this is about that view on the promenade deck. That's why there weren't enough lifeboats on the Titanic. We could have put enough lifeboats on it, but it was going to spoil the view for the rich people. We've got to get over this. I published a vision for transport a couple of years ago now. don't have the transport powers yet. We're working on that. But this was about, uh, you can get your groceries delivered. If you can get a public transport system that's affordable and cheap enough, that has sensors on all the parking spaces, the whole thing integrated through a device on your smartphone, whereby you, have, you can plot your routes so that you can integrate buses with active travel with, in my part of the world, the metro, other parts, the trams, then you can get all of these things to the point where your efficiency is so high that it's convenient to not own a car is to own a car. And once you do that, people are thinking, well, do I need a car to get to work? Do I need a car to get to education? Do I need a car for my shopping? I don't. I might need a car if I want to go away for the weekend or if there's an away game. Well, there's car clubs for that. And I sat down with Martin Gilbert, who's the head of Go Northeast, one of our local bus companies. Um, it was actually at a chamber dinner, di chamber dinner a couple of years ago and was telling him about all of this. And... Um, just last week, they launched with a partnership with the local car club, where it's the same ticket gets you all the way through it. And they're taking, you take bikes on the buses and things like that. And that's without us even having the power to do it. So I'm really chuffed that some of the leaders of our private transport companies are on board with this and getting it. We really can build that alliance. And it's got to be about connecting people and not moving vehicles. One of the things in the transport strategy, it talks about hydrogen. Green hydrogen has got to be the way to go. When we look at blue hydrogen, for those of you who are interested in, in engineering papers, look it up. It was, there's a link through it from a, a good article in The Guardian. The blue hydrogen, over its lifespan, produces more emissions than burning oil because of the leakage. There's a 3% leakage of methane, which is 18 more, times more powerful as a greenhouse gas. Um, the, the process of heating the steam to make blue hydrogen involves burning the gas and the emissions go up the flue. So yes, you might end up with zero tailpipe emissions, but the life cycle emissions are worse. Those of us who did um, O-level sciences will remember electrolysis, anode and cathode. That's the way to do it. But for that, we need a decarbonized grid. And that's what we're investing in very heavily in the north of time, putting money into offshore wind. Time is brief. Where does the money come from? We already spend it. It costs £4,600 a year to own and run a car on average. Replacing the North's 8 million cars with electric vehicles, if that £2,500 electric car grant stays the same, that's going to be 20 billion quid. There's lots of money getting pumped into this system that's available already. And depending on how you measure it, there's 21 million people, according to the RAC, in transport poverty in the UK. Obesity in the UK... Public Health England says it's going to cost 49.9 billion a year by 2050, the same year we're due to hit that decarbonisation target. Well, in the northeast transport area, that's 1.65 billion a year. Our transport budget is 1.160 million a year, a tenth of what obesity is going to cost us. We will be spending this money anyway. Let's spend it now to decarbonise it, get people fit, get people walking. How do we do that? We need the powers and the financial tools. Land value uplift. Every time we put public amenities in, the value of the land goes up around it. Well, give us the power to put a charge on that, and it can self-fund these things. Invest to save. Let's have some of the money that's been diverted into fixing health problems, into preventing health problems, 
by a better transport system where people move and stay fitter. We've got the money. We've put 69 billion into furlough, 37 billion into test and trace. When there's an emergency, we can fix it. We've got to think about this as what it's going to cost us if we don't fix it. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, I'm glad you touched on our decarbonisation strategy, which I hope many of you uh, have read, and I'm sure Tim will tell us much more about that. And also the future travel scenarios that you referenced there, another really fantastic and insightful piece of work as well, all available on the transportforthenorth.com website. Just my little plug there. Thank you, Jamie. Our next panellist is Professor Piers Forster, Director of the Priestley Centre at the University of Leeds. Over to you, Piers. Yeah, well, it, it is fantastic to be here today. My first in-person kind of conference for a very long time. So I'm a professor up here at the university, but I also sit on the Government Climate Change Committee, so I'll, I'll be talking about the, the, the way that our committee's proposal for decarbonisation does fit in with the Transport for the North ideas. Uh, uh, and I was also an author of the recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that published the United Nations update on kind of where the world had got to. And I was very impressed by Jamie's background in the kind of science there, Jamie. So good job. Uh, um, but um, so interesting, I think, just to reflect as kind of, kind of Jamie did at, at the beginning, kind of where we've got to. So, so, the, so the whole world is currently already uh, 1.2 degrees of temperature change since that country industrial time, and we are we are already witnessing the extremes of climate change are already occurring, um, like kind of flooding and kind of heat waves in particular, um, uh, 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 and that's the first thing. What I was very impressed by the transfer for the North decarbonisation strategy about because they're one of the very few documents I come across that does talk about not only do you have to decarbonise, you also have to adapt your transport network for what is to come. Uh, and, and that, for example, wasn't in the, D, the DFT idea and their plan for a strategy that they've just published at all. So, so uh, and so it's fantastic that Trump for the North are cons considering this adaptation component. Um, um, the other thing I want to say that comes from kind of, kind of where we've got to, I've sort of been doing this business for a long time uh, and I have started to write reports and and uh, sometimes these reports can work, for example. We publish the committee, our report on the net zero target, and then the government can legislate for that target. And the latest six carbon budget report was for this 78% reduction in emissions by the 2035, and that has now been legislated as well. Um, uh, and so we're not only seeing the targets get more and more, more, and I do think if you look, if you look around lots of organisations, we have the right targets, so we now have to change from setting targets to actually delivering the targets, and especially over the next two to five year time frame, we have to put all the things in there to actually deliver the 2035 targets. Um, but but we, I want to inject a bit of optimism toward it. The things are, in fact, changing. You, you talked about, Jamie, in fact, that we're on course currently for kind of three degrees of temperature change or above that. But, you know, but, but if you do look at the world commitments currently, that are being negotiated again at this 
big COP conference. Uh, uh, if you do put all the commitments, commitments together, they will come to around 2.7 degrees. So, 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 so that gives optimism that we as a kind of global society will kind of, kind of, we have already got off those worst outcomes. We we were heading for much higher temperatures can potentially. Uh, and we all, we already have built renewable energy. We've already moved away from burning coal. So so I want to inject optimism that we can change. Um and we have decarbonized our energy supply very well, but we now have to decarbonize our transportation, of course, and that is now the biggest emitting se sector in the whole country. So that is really where we have to put our efforts in the immediate time frame. Uh, um, uh, and what I would say, Jamie said here too, that uh, I would like to see much more emphasis on the behavior change of our population, trying to encourage people to drive not such big kind of cars and things, and this, this kind of SUV driving culture didn't really come into the DFT to the strategy at all. The, the other thing that were absent in that, in that GFT approach, which I think Time for the North can perhaps address is the pale decarbonization. That sort of wasn't talked about the way the, the, the government will, will really deliver on that decarbonization. So it'd be good to talk about that today. Uh, 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 um, and perhaps one more thing would be the great analytical work done by Tim and Peter Cole and people in for, for, for producing this document. We're, we're, uh, I think thankful for the North can give the local cities and the councils the, the analytical expert to be able to decarbonize effectively what are the real kind of first order things that different governments within the region can do. Um, uh, and I just focus on the other thing where I think TFN can really contribute, and that is on this integration and the systems approach that both Tracy and Martin talked about today. And it, and it was very obvious, if you look at the DFT, decarbonization strategy, they, they called the parts of it that were difficult that they put in the hand of other government departments, either MHCLG or particularly HMT, of course, in the Treasury, and what will be the tax regime to make this work? Uh, um, uh, uh, and I think that where TFN, so what I would encourage TFN to do is not just talk to DFT, in fact, to really talk to these other government departments. So that's where I end now. Cheers. particularly our insight on the, the statistics, the, I think I the do evidence. Have to come far. <laughs> <laughs> um, really nice to hear you use the word optimism several times there because there are reasons to be optimistic and this is a challenge that we're very much uh, ready and, and, and able to, to meet. Uh, and final uh, panellist is Tim Foster, who is Interim Strategy and Programme Director with us at Transport for the North. Over to you, Tim, for some <laughs> opening remarks. Thanks, Gemma, and um, morning, everybody. Um, uh, I, 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 I don't want to say too much more beyond um, what the first two speakers have said, really. I think there's a, there, there, there are some there's a huge opportunities here, uh, and but also some realistic challenges and some really urgent action that needs to be taken. <coughs> and, um, you know, when we, when we set out on the journey of 
producing a decarbonisation strategy. And, and this is the first transport decarbonisation strategy for the whole of the North. Um, that, actually, that actually we started from some quite big fundamental challenges. We got, we got a strategic transport plan that we were immensely proud of, had been agreed by the whole of the North, but actually was focused entirely around growth, productivity, jobs, uh, and, and lacked, that, lacked that balance um, around decarbonisation. So we knew we needed to strengthen um, that side of the debate. Um, but, actually, but actually, through the work on the decarbonisation strategy, uh, um, and particularly the really robust, um, um, really quite innovative analytical work of which we are immensely proud, that has really taken us through towards where actually we can not only just rebalance some of the some of the objectives in the strategic transport plan, but actually start to look more fundamentally at how do we achieve the opportunity of a yep still an integrated, better connected north, but one in which actually where um, clean growth is right at the forefront um, of what TFN is trying to achieve. Um, and uh, so the strategic transport, um, sorry, the the the, the decarbonisation um, plan. Um, is really the vehicle for doing that. Um, and I, I, I won't sort of repeat the, um, uh, what my fellow panellists have said about um, what's in it, and I hope you've all had the chance to read it. Well, the thing what we have been doing um, uh, over the summer is consulting on it, both with the public um, uh, and with stakeholder groups. And, uh, and again, that, that in itself has been a great experience to sort of hear from people right across the north and, and see those views. The consultation closed at the end of um, August. Uh, we're now in the stages of looking at what people have said back to us, but we had over 200 responses, um, of which a very large number actually were from individual members of the public. So we were really, we were, you know, and, and overall the response to the consultation was extremely positive. You know, people really a, a saw the value of a strategy, of, of a strategy at a northern level for the first time, um, and um, uh, uh, and we had lots of support for the kind of actions that TFN has been talking about in its decarbonisation strategy. Um, uh, and again, it's already been said, uh, uh, we need to take urgent action, but actually those opportunities are there and they're, they're here now. And there are a number of things that, that we've called for in the, um, uh, in the plan, um, in the plan, and said that that needs to happen between now and 2025, um, and that's both that's both uh, you know what we can do in partnership, both with the department, um, particularly on analytics, particularly on uh, on behaviour change, um, as, as well as with um, with the industry and the delivery bodies. Um, you know, and, uh, and uh, lots of. Uh, lots of very positive work um, and good, strong work going on now around decarbonisation of rail, for example, which which it, it doesn't need to wait for HS2 and Northern Pass Rail, but actually can be delivered relatively early, um, uh, and um, and really start to help um, to um, uh, not only to decarbonise rail itself, but actually to create that more efficient, more reliable um, rail network across the north. Um, really as quickly as possible. And do, so doing all that in advance of um, the arrival, particularly of Northern Powers Rail. Um, so so uh, rail is a big opportunity. Um, uh, clearly, the, 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 you know, the pandemic has shifted um, and accelerated the trend towards um, uh, uh, EV and, and use of other fuels, but principally EV. So there's a, there's a major piece of work that we're now starting already to look at uh, how can how can we actually plan for um, uh, an EV charging infrastructure network across the north of England that actually can deliver better outcomes for people more quickly? Um, uh, and so there's a range of there's a range of things that at a strategic level we could do, um, but also principally, you know, I think we see our role as as Martin said this morning, and as Piers has just alluded to, is really helping to make that systems. Um, uh, systems process work much more effectively and so therefore um, not only being here to make the case for more investment in transport but also about the way in which transport can work with other sectors um, 
and, and create really, really effective place-based holistic solutions to all of this. So lot, as I said, lots of, lots of really positive opportunity and, and those are the actions that we'll be both reflecting on as we, as we look at what's come out of the consultation but also moving into a world where actually we're starting to then drive actions and delivery um, over the next phase. So I'll leave it there for now, Gemma, and um, let people ask questions. As uh, Piers was very much on uh, talking about optimism and, and there you referenced opportunities a few times as well. And again, that's so important to, to recognise that there are opportunities in all of this. Um, I want to start by thinking about uh, behaviour change. Jamie, you talked about how essentially we're moving people around by moving massive cars around behaviour change is a, a going to be a massive challenge. How do we start to tackle that? All behaviour change usually comes in response to two things, um, a negative pressure and a positive opportunity. Um, and putting people out of a rut usually is when they're unhappy or something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to be honest with people that... There are things that are just not going to happen, that are going to be expensive, that when carbon pricing comes in, and it will, um, things are going to get very, very expensive. And the mistake would be to leave it until then and wait for that to cause the behavior change. Mm -hmm. The behavior shift needs to be at the same time as you are reallocating road space, for example, um, that you have to have a public transport system which is good enough to get people where they want to go. Mm -hmm. And it requires that full integration. The primary reason that most people use a car is not because it's cheaper, because almost everybody moans about the cost of driving. It's because you can go out, you can, whether it's in the street or on the drive, and you can stick your key in or beep it, and it, you, can, you just go. And very few people believe that about the alternatives. So once you start to believe that the alternatives are good enough, then the measures that say, and by the way, you have to pay the real cost of that car and count for the externalities of destroying the planet, they'll say, yeah, I don't want it anymore, actually, because I've got an alternative that works. Mm -hmm. So we call that rock-up transport. The basic idea that you get your phone out and you can say, where do I need to go? Boom. Ah, oh, I did not do that. Right, and that's that easy, because at the moment, people, if they're going somewhere novel, it's quite hard to find out. Mm -hmm. That's why mass transit systems work, because mm -hmm. the, the infrastructure is permanent. You know where the stations are, and people will walk anything up to a kilometre and a half to get to a station. Not many people, but some. A bus, well, it's a few hundred metres um, because you're, they're not permanent. You don't quite believe it. You don't know if the bus is going to come. So you need all of that. But it also works with that integration. So a lot of places now in Newcastle, we've got the uh, e-scooter things, but you've got to get your licence and you've mm -hmm. got to join it and all the rest of it. And if you're commuting, you want to know that there's one outside your front door and not think... Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if I get, and there's not one there tomorrow, I can't get to work on time, and I'm in trouble. Um, so again, that's gonna be personal things mm -hmm. and making sure that there is the network, the road space, the cycle tracks, whatever it might be. Because I see people riding these things on the road and it is literally an accident waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. Piers, how does that uh, multimodal um, integrated transport network, how does that then tie in with, with what you touched on regarding being adaptable to the future? Yeah, well, the first thing I think is we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We have to get on with this, with putting in this new infrastructure and trying to get people to behave differently. So. So I think a great thing people did during lockdown was just put in the bike lanes. They were, rather than putting expensive bike lanes, for example, they put in these kind of temporary ones and they did kind of close up communities with kind of concrete kind of plant pots and things to stop the cars going up the streets. Uh, and that upset a lot of the population. But, but it, I think with time they will calm down uh, and just kind of, kind of, kind of demonstrate that these things can work uh, uh, and that it, uh, it's okay to change. So, so you do have to, you have to, you have to make the high carbon option the difficult and expensive one and take the low carbon option the cheap and the easy one. Uh, 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 
uh, and I think when we go into this kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of future, it's all about resilience. So, so it has to be resilience to the impact of climate change, but it also has to be quite resilient to where our society might end up. Because you talk about Jamie and that, it's all about trying to empower communication. We, we, we don't transport ourselves across the country necess necessarily to get ourselves to that point. We get ourselves there because we want to transfer goods or we want to kind of communicate with that person. So, so, so it has to fit in with wh where we go with home working and with digital infrastructure and where people will want to be. So, so what, where, what we have to design in that kind of, kind of flexibility as well. So it's quite a kind of challenging thing to do, but, but, but I think that's where can the TFN can really show what are the solutions that might, del might deliver that. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps one more thing is that it's not just one size fits all. We're going to have the cars for some people, we're going to have cash transport for others, others can walk and bicycle, but but so, so I, I think we have to think. Oh, that is the that is the answer. Somehow we have a whole lot of answers, and we have to make it all all work. Mm. Thank you, Tim. How does that need to be adaptable and forward looking? How is that written into TFN strategies, frameworks, analytical tools? Yeah. So the principle, the principle driver, and the and the and the foundation of everything we do uh, are the transport scenarios that Jamie that Jamie talked through and, and that they're deliberately set up to be quite extreme views of the world so that we have got that um, uh, that very broad range of potential outcomes it does feel as though whatever we, whatever we do next it has to be flexible it has to be resilient uh, you know if, if the last two years have taught us anything is that we we can't predict the future um, and that things are going to change in ways that we can't conceive now. So, uh, so actually, what we need to do is be preparing for the widest range of possible futures and to have infrastructure, but also places that are flexible and respond to, uh, can respond to those kind of things. So, so, you know, the integration with land use change, for example, is, is a really important part of, um, of all of this. I, I think for us, though, it's also about actually the breadth of Ex lived experience right across the north. So, you know, for example, in rural areas, um, you know, the challenges around rural mobility um, and uh, uh, you know where roads continue will will always continue to be the the primary mechanism for getting around. Um, of course, it will be, and it's about how do we how do we make that as clean as possible. But actually, how do you bring the choice and opportunity that comes from having a public transport network in city regions? Actually, that people in rural areas also need that choice about about connectivity mm. um so how do we, how do we do all of that and there's a you know there's lots of really good work going on around the, uh some national transport bodies around rural mobility but it does feel like again from an affordability and investment point of view we're still at quite an early stage in really understanding mm. how to make that work mm. Mm. Uh, jamie if i could come back to you for one final question before we open it up to the floor you talked about active travel you mentioned the obesity crisis how how do we look at the wider impacts and benefits and opportunities of decarbonisation and the way we travel for for society more generally? It's not just about climate change and, and, and tackling um, the, the, the carbon emissions, is it? It's interesting, isn't it? If we look at the last 20, 30 years of economic trajectory, um, as it's been ups and downs, but as, as generally as wealth has increased, so as mental ill health. Mm. And you've got to ask, what's gone wrong there? Mm. And there is a massive amount of atomization of people in their lives. So one of the good things about public transport is you actually get to talk to people and smile at people. And it's also one of the bad things that people might not like <laughs> it. But it's human, and it's what we are and what we're designed to do mm -hmm. you know, by nature. I'm not a creationist. Um, but it's also the physical benefits of it. Um, rural transport, Tim was talking about, it's a big issue. It's actually one of the hardest places to cycle is in rural areas because you've got to go on the same road where someone's going to whiz past you mm -hmm. if you're lucky at 60 miles an hour. Um, and the, the slipstream from that can pull you off your bike. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, you know, we, we have to think that, yes, you might want to get around places, but can't we just take a 35 kilo e-bike? Mm. Because how often are you actually going to be taking something that needs a car to bring it back? You know? So there's these sorts of things. Um, so there's wider benefits. The financial benefits are huge. Our transport system, as I said, is very expensive. £4,600 a year to own and run a car. Most people, are, or, or certainly many millions of people, are in transport poverty because of that. They are making choices that are financially unsustainable mm -hmm. so they can get around. The answer to this is the systems approach that both Piers and Tim have been talking about. But it requires the devolution of decision <coughs> making to way beyond the level that I'm at. So yes, there's a regional mayor, but actually, frankly, to really quite micro levels. Mm -hmm. If we look at the, some of the strings that come with things like cycling funds, yes, you can buy street furniture, yes, you can put a bit of tarmac down, but you can't sponsor a shower. Now, the new office that we're moving into has a shower. Mm -hmm. So when I run to work, I can do it. But if you work in Greg's, yeah, you're not going to run to work because everyone's going to be doing that while you're serving them food. So we need the sort of the flexibility and development of real innovative approaches that say, how do you want to live your life? Mm. Because connecting people, exactly as Pierce says, does not involve necessarily moving people around. Thank you. Uh, Piers or Tim, did you want to respond on that before we open it up? Um, yeah, one quick thing. I wanted to say, but I think perhaps I won't bother. Let's open it up. Let's have some no, go ahead. No, please no, no, do. No, 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 no. Come on. Let's, let's open it up. I okay. Any questions then from the floor, please? Yes. There's one there. Um, Councillor Richard Good um, from Richmondshire, and I also sit on the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority, so I was particularly interested in the comments on rural transport. We do have bus services in the rural areas, but they are appallingly publicised. The county council puts subsidy into providing the buses, quite a large amount, which they can struggling to afford, but the nobody puts any money into publicising them. I, I, I have to use public transport because 30 years ago I had to stop driving due to my eyesight when I w worked here in Leeds, so I moved from Leeds to Ark and Garthdale, one of the most rural places in the, in the Yorkshire Dales, mm -hmm. and managed partly by friends and partly by walking, partly by cycling, partly by getting to the... To, to the bus, uh, and that we have a rural bus service. My friends in mine in the Dale say, oh, there's no bus services, because they're not publicised, because we're operating on very small 17-seater um, buses run by, run by um, um, uh, a, a, a small company based in Hawes. But if we improve the publicity, if we um, also made it a lot simpler for people to perhaps park their cars and then use a bus, um, discount on car parking if you use a bus. And the other thing, which I know uh, um, Transport of the North have worked very hard on and didn't quite succeed, is getting through ticketing. Because through ticketing must be the most vital thing in all of them. Because we have three, for me to travel to, to Darlington from home, I've got to use two bus companies. Now, okay, I've got a bus pass. There's a few advantages of getting old, you get a bus pass. Mm -hmm. um, but but um, the, the cost, when I sit on the, the bus and hear what people are paying mm -hmm. to go from, from Reeth to Darlington, seven pounds mm. and come back here so a 14 pound trip just to go to Darlington to do some decent shopping mm. you know very simple things like that um, um, cycling was mentioned cycling has improved dramatically mm. since of course we have the Tour de France and the Tour de Yorkshire mm. um, some of the locals are fed up with cyclists three abreast pulling on our little roads but you know cycling has definitely improved but again we need to need more encouragement for it mm. and and if you could bring your bike to the Dales on the train of course you might only find two parking, uh, two um, slots on the train to, to put your bike mm. on, on a train with mm. six or seven carriages. So I we just on enough now, but there are a few points there. But, but please don't forget rural transport. It's rather important. Absolutely. Uh, Jamie, you mentioned about that, that system where you can sort of rock up and see on your phone which bus is next and, and that, whether it's delayed or not. That is so important, isn't it? Well, Richard's absolutely spot on. The main barrier to making a, a transition is knowing about that transition mm. option. Um, and it's one of these things that it hits a critical mass, that when <coughs> other people are doing it and other people are talking about it, you think, oh, can I do that as well? Is it available to mm. me? Mm. Um, and that also requires the service to hit a, a critical mass level. So you can do that. Mobility is a service. The transport professionals here will be very familiar with it. It's got to be the way we go. Um, and 
the, it's the full integration of everything, including, Richard was talking about car parking there, including, you can put a sensor very easily on, you know, a camera can do it these mm -hmm. days, dead easily, boom, right, there's the spaces, and actually, buy, I want to book my space so I know I can park my car mm -hmm. when I get to the train station, wherever it is, the bus station. So that's got to be the route through. Um, and it, it is, there's a few things about modal shift that we need to get right as well. The expectation that you're not going to turn up in a suit and tie. Now, I came on the train, so it was quite easy. But I gave up my car, and I cycled the meetings around Newcastle now. Um, and the northeast is not necessarily got the sunniest weather in the world. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I get there, and I'm wet. Um, or So I turn up with trainers. Mm -hmm. And it's people have got to get used to the mayor turning up in trainers uh, and things you can cycle in. Um, I've never yet turned up in lycra, though. <laughs> Uh, yes, I think the gentleman in the check shirt here had his hand up um, right at the start. If we can come to him, please. Yeah, what do, what do our uh, guests um, believe with the Leeds City Council that uh, once we increase flights to Leeds Bradford Airport by 75% and, and at the same time it's cancelling its clean air zone? Uh, Piers, do you want to comment on the decarbonisation of uh, air yeah, travel? Well, well, so, yeah, so the first thing to say is you can't do, you can't do all the air ports and the aeroplane flights and the passengers that come to and from New York Airport. The, just to compare to the region, I think it's slightly to say difficult to bring that into their decarbonisation plan because it's a huge carbon con con footprint they have to add on, but I think they should add it onto their decarbonisation pathways, uh, uh, and, and they do have to include the aeroplane flight in that trajectory. Um, but, but so, I mean, the other thing, you, know, you have just as you encourage behaviour for the car, you have to encourage behaviour for planes too. And I think now, I mean, I was an international climate change professor, but that's still my job. So I used to travel around the world all the time to talk to people in various countries, but I don't have to do that. So, so you can get rid of those kind of, kind of, kind of business aeroplane flights. Uh, and you can encourage people to holiday in this country, of course, and other things like that. So uh, I think it's not necessarily you have to say that that can reduce, that can increase our footprint. I think you can inclu include it in the footprint and you can mm -hmm. come up with ways of doing it. And you can increase the kind of connectivity there, again, to kind of high-speed rail, of course. And, I mean, I travel around Europe now. By that, I go on a high-speed train to St. Pancras and then go on. Uh, so, 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 yeah, um, so, it, so it does have to be... Uh, uh, and one of the big co-benefits is, you're right, the air quality aspects. Uh, and people have been blessed over the last 12 months with good air quality where people weren't driving around in the inner cities. Uh, and, we d and we don't want to go back to where it was. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. Uh, as you take your pick, um, blessing, if you could, for me. <laughs> that makes my life easier. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Darren Hale. I'm the leader of Whole City Council. Well, just following up what Jamie was saying, it, it is interesting because 45% of our residents do not have access to a car, which you think is a good place to start in terms of uh, modal shift. Um, what I would say, though, is that a lot of them, that's not by choice. It's by, by sort of because of, obviously, poverty and... and, and uh, <coughs> and economic position and they they longingly and a good few of them longingly want a car because you know and that's the problem we have in terms of modal shift and, w and we certainly have rolled out huge numbers of the government cycle lane there has been a huge you know for the government money for the cycle lane, there's been a huge shift in cycling in a very flat city where <coughs> geography lends itself <coughs> to cycling but i have to say to you you know that that's not gone down well amongst a lot of people so one, t one of the problems we have is how do we get that sort of cultural shift? Because in a city like ours where there was significant flooding, about one in five houses as recently as 20, 2007, um, you'd think it would be a natural 
receptive audience, but it's not that easy. And I think it's mm -hmm. about how we do, we'll, we, as local authority leaders, we'll certainly push that agenda and do all we can to, to aid modal shift and talk, talk the language of doing so. Mm -hmm. But I, I do worry about how, you know, how we join that up with the government thinking because mm -hmm. there is still, we're, we're pushing, mm -hmm. it's not an easy push to make. And that's what I'd say from a city which has quite a lot of the advantages for climate, uh, for, for um, modal shift. Mm -hmm. And it's still not an easy, mm -hmm. easy mm -hmm. thing to sort of, um, to, to base it. It's not an easy conversation to have. And I suppose I'm sure you'd agree with that probably mm -hmm. yourselves in, in your own uh, localities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tim, I wonder whether you wanted to uh, comment in respect to that and in yeah. terms of the responses that we had to the consultation on the decarbonisation strategy and what are people saying about this idea of modal shift? Does it feel like an option for people? I, I, I think what, what, what does seem to come through is, is that actually, yeah, that's a, that's a shift that people want to make mm. and are willing to make but don't necessarily have the choices. Um, and we're about, we're about to, we're just in the final phase actually of um, finishing a major piece of research on transport related social exclusion, which really will help get to the heart of what are the real barriers that people face uh, and, and what can we do to, to actually um, increase people's access to opportunities. Um, uh, I, live in I live in Sheffield, which is full of hills <laughs> um, and it's, ter it's terrible for cycling and the roads are really narrow <laughs> and, and some of those, some of those temporary measures that have been put in place over the last couple of years have been have been controversial mm -hmm. in places but also there's an ethos in the city where which is very much about it being an outdoor city um and, and, and a big cycling community mm -hmm. so actually uh, there's, a, there's a balance there's obviously going to be a balance here and i think the way in which particularly the way in which tfn supports partners particularly in this space um Again, again, is not an area that we did very much on in the early days of TFM because we were all about big road and rail schemes and connecting bits of the north. But the more the more we get into this, and the, particularly the way in which decarbonisation has changed our thinking, is we, we, it's it's now entirely about how do we how do we get to that um, systems uh, place based approach mm. that absolutely mm. needs these these kind of joined mm. up solutions. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, it gets to what Jamie's talking about. You, ha you have to really bring the conversation down to the community. Mm -hmm. Little, but it's, I would recommend do begin with the children. You know, begin with the kids in school. There ought to be kind of bike. There will be bike change between your city centre and every school, uh, and get the kids going to school that way, and then they will grow up that way. Mm. So the, forget about the oldies that don't want it. We just go with the kind of kids that do. Just to uh, pick up on that, uh, hopefully you'll have seen our uh, special guest for this afternoon is Dame Sarah Storey, who's the Active Travel Commissioner for Sheffield City Region and obviously a very uh, accomplished Paralympian. And I know she is doing a lot of work to encourage people, uh, the youngsters, to, to walk and cycle to school. So please do make sure you're still here for the uh, closing session. Uh, can we come down to the front here, please? This gentleman's got his hand up. Um, I'm Councillor Andy Dagger, uh, Deputy Leader of uh, York City Council, um, and I have uh, lived in and campaigned for cycling over the years in both Sheffield and, and Hull, so I'm familiar with the lay of the land there. The question I wanted to ask really was about how quickly can we move to road pricing on a, a regional basis? Um, you know, inevitably it's going to come as m more. Uh, vehicles that are electric, the government's going to have to get the money from somewhere, and can we actually use that as, as to pump prime uh, sustainable transport as an, as an alternative for carrot to, to go with the stick? Is that something that we, we think Transport for the North could take a lead on or be pushing for on a regional basis? Um, because inevitably, any one city or urban area is not going to want to be the one, as we've seen in, in the example with Leeds and the charging clean air zone, you know, but backtracking on that, how, how do we over, get over that hurdle to, to incentivise sustainable travel? Jamie, would you like to comment on? Yeah, um, the short answer, Andy, is yes, we should be doing it. Um, it's the way <coughs> we've got to go. One of the, in Newcastle, the clean air zone is, is being delayed. Um, 
The primary objection, and one that, that I objected to this method of it, was the legislation meant that if you bought yourself a nice new 65 grand Range Rover, you were exempt. But if you used someone driving around in a 10-year-old Ford Fiesta, you had to pay it. And that's what outraged people as much as anything else. Um, so the devolution of a whole series of financial streams, of which road pricing has to be one, um, and that does indeed, you can, the, the technology is, all right, it's, it's a major piece of work, but it's actually it's a tiny, tiny fraction of something like HS2, and it makes a big difference. And the technology is applicable then a huge range of transport benefits and systems. We actually, it, it's partly in response to, to Darren's problem, uh, Darren's question. Um, one of the things that is going to make a difference is when we reduce the cost and increase the convenience of public transport anyway. And this is the transponders on the buses, the bus gates. Mm. There's one, one in Newcastle now, near where I live, and it's brilliant, and it works. And the buses come along, and it goes down the, the lane, and it stops the traffic for all the cars. And then people in the cars see the bus driving past them, and that's when they'll start to think, ah, you know what, I don't want to do it. Stick in road pricing as well. Um, and you've got a, a strong motivator to get to this point. Citizens Assembly on Climate Change, though, we did one, and um, it's a fantastic way of getting everybody involved genuinely to think, actually, now we've seen the evidence, we get the direction yeah, we've yeah, got to go. Mm. Great. Thank you. Uh, yes, gentleman here in the middle, please. Yes, please. Maria's got the microphone for you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Clive Barton speaking. Um, I'm a vice chair of the uh, Real User Group at Bradford. Um, right. Um, the uh, press bulletins that come out from uh, TFN uh, do not really plug uh, the uh, efficiency of uh, rail transport when it, when it comes to energy usage. Um, we're not, we're given, according to the government, Back in the 1970s, a train will do with a gallon of fuel what um, a bus or lorry needs five gallons and a plane needs, and an aeroplane needs ten gallons. The only thing that's any better is the ship or the barge. Uh, and we're not getting this message across. So therefore, the masses do not appreciate the benefits of rail travel. It, there's no doubt about that. Um, the thing is, what we should be planning for now to... Uh, sorry. What we should be planning for now is uh, probably at least a doubling of rail usage. And I don't just mean for passengers, I mean for freight. Um, the thing is, we've got uh, a lot of driver shortage. Now, we all know, I think everybody will be aware in this room, that a train will probably take uh, 50 or 60 lorries off the road. Um, Ian Islop on his programme recently was at Felix Doe Dock. And he showed you uh, uh, what I would call a proper freight train. It grossed over 2,000 tonnes. Now, how many lorries is that on just one driver? And just think of the saving in uh, energy and pollution. Now, another pollution that's come out recently, uh, and this was Adrian Childs on his journey around the IRC. He went to Bangor University, and he had a sample of seawater, and they looked at it, and he pointed out, that's rubber dust. And it's in the sea. And the rubber dust, where's it coming from? It's coming from lorries, buses, cars, and aeroplanes. And it's washing into the watercourse, into the sea. And what, what do we get from the sea? Fish. And the fish are eating all this. Mm. So we are the recipient of this pollution. Mm. Mm. I'm sorry, but this is how I see it. Uh, and we've had some very good speech. Yeah. gentleman here complaining. Are you from, from Reef? Yeah. You're right. Now, the thing is, Reith used to be on the railway from no, Darlington. Sorry, <laughs> Richmond, sorry. I apologise. It was planned but never built. Right, thank you. And we lost that railway. Now, the thing is, not far from Richmond is Catterick Camp. Now, the thing is, I don't know how many people, what the population of that area is. I know one thing, that around Catterick Camp, massive housing is planned. And after that, it, we should be getting the railway back into Richmond so that people have an, uh, an environmentally clean mm. alternative, which they don't have. I wonder, Piers, would you Thanks like to comment? Thank you. Piers, would you like to... 
I, <laughs> the efficiency I of, of just rail. I completely agree with that. In fact. I, I, I think we can do a better job communicating, a better to get with train. But, but what I would say to, I think we have to get the price of the ticket correct. I mean, you talk about what it costs to drive a car, in mm. fact, Jamie, but it's interesting that the, if you look at the kind of trend in the price, the price of car driving, that hasn't gone up as fast as the price of public transport has gone up. So the price of public transport is going up faster than the bus and train. So that differential does have to mm. swing very large in opposite direction. But yeah, the other point of the we. I think we can do a better job communicating the opportunity, particularly for the HGV and the freight. And I think that what TFN have done really well yeah. articulating that mm. to be looking at the decarbonisation strategy. Yep. So along, alongside the work on decarbonisation, we've also been working on freight, and the freight strategy again um, will be will be emerging in in the coming weeks. And that really does, uh, in a very integrated way, make exactly. Um, the points that the gentleman is making, it's really, mm. uh, it's really welcome. Uh, there was a point I was going to make. It's gone completely out of my head. Uh, I think, I, oh, I think, uh, sorry, um, <laughs> you're talking about future rail demand. Yes. And, and I think this is one of the big, um, you know, this is one of the big challenges, actually. Um, and, it, uh, and in the creation now of Great British Railways and a new governance around ro uh, the, the rail system that will bring back together sort of services and priorities and services alongside infrastructure development is, is, is the assumptions that are made in the planning forecast about growth of rail. Mm -hmm. Because in our, in our view, all those really wide future travel scenarios all have extensive rail growth in them. And in some scenarios, um, uh, two, three, four times the level of growth um, over the coming decades. Uh, uh, whereas actually some of the there is a real risk actually that, that both because the, the cost of rail travel is baked in in terms of um, um, uh, uh, um, the um, things come right on my head at the moment um, uh, the, the price escalator um, but also because of assumptions that actually because of EV um, roll out that actually by 2025 2030 2035 the cost of the cost of driving if we're not careful, becomes really more attractive than it currently mm. is now. Mm. So what happens post fuel duty exercise mm. is, a, is a big part of the mm. conversation actually about, sure. about pro alongside mm. rail mm. pricing, about the relative costs of, of transport. And so that's, that's a huge area for, mm. for us next, I think. We are very, sorry, we are very quickly uh, running out of time. Uh, Jamie, do you want to make some closing remarks? Well, very briefly, yeah. Uh, both Tim and Piers have hit on the problem there, is the price. Where's the money come from? Um, because I started talking about targets, but it's delivery that matters. And Clive's point about increasing, there's any number of rail schemes we could do. Um, I've got a paper that's due to be published in a couple of weeks' time, but it's about the devolution of finance mechanisms. <coughs> One of the ones is land value capture. If you put in a railway line, the value of the land around it shoots up. It literally generates wealth. All we need is the power to put a charge on that. Nobody loses. The only pay it back when they sell the land or the property. And that would allow us to massively accelerate the amount of public transport that we can fund in really short-term timescales, mm -hmm. as opposed to 10, 20-year grip schemes, which I'm sure everybody loves. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Piers, a closing statement from yourself? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. And the other thing is, I think TFN can play the role of a Local delivery unit for the government, where you get these longer-term kind of financial in, in, in investments, but then the local region does have to make a commitment to making the change there. So uh, I just come back to this into the integration and the huge opportunities that come with the connection from central government down to the level of the community. And I think this is where everyone can appear together can go ahead and make that change. 
Thank you. Uh, Tim, do you want to finish by telling us what's next on the TFN decarbonisation strategy and when we expect to see that? Uh, well, so, um, yeah, so consultation just closed. Um, uh, and I, uh, at the end of November, it will come back to the TFN board uh, with both the outcomes from the consultation and, and a final version of the strategy to, uh, to seek the board to formally adopt. Um, uh, but as I said earlier, alongside that, a lot of activity and a lot happening from us in terms of EV charging, um, uh, um, active travel, and of course, continuing to make the case for rail investment. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody for joining us today. Thank you again to our panelists. Please do enjoy your lunch. Join us upstairs for the podcast session as well over lunchtime, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.
Good afternoon, and it's so nice to see so many faces out and about today. For me, this is the first time I've actually been out in about a year and a half, so I feel like it's a bit of a baptism of fire, really. Um, so today, we're talking about funding the transport projects that we need. In a post-COVID world where the North has suffered disproportionately, there have been real significant challenges to public finances, but there's also a really strong narrative around building back better from the pandemic. So we're going to be talking about the challenges and the opportunities of financing and funding transport over the coming years, where the obstacles lie and what can be done in both the public and private sector to accommodate this. So I'm joined by a fantastic panel. Um, we've got Ian Craven, the Finance Director of Transport for the North. We've got Councillor Charlie Edwards, TFN board member for Lancashire. Sir Roger Marsh, who probably needs no introduction. And we've got Emma Antrobus as well, the Northwest Director of the Institute for Civil Engineers. So Ian, if I can start with you for in terms of opening remarks. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's probably worth just recalling um, what it is we're trying to fund here. So Martin mentioned it earlier in the, in the plenary session. Um, the this, this strategic transport plan sets out a plan for sustainable and inclusive economic growth, and it sets out a plan that will deliver 850,000 jobs over 30 years, 40 years. Um, and delivering that strategic transport plan is, is pretty fundamental to TFN's purpose. There is a kind of long version to this, which I think we, you, you, I could go through, which is which um, you know talks around the, 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 the funding. But it, if you um, read back into that STP and if you look at the Northern Transport Charter, the funding that we need is 2.3 billion a year to deliver that plan. Um, I think it's fair to say that the way that the British state is is organises itself at the moment. Um, uh, and the lack of devolution, the centralisation of the way that government works, and particularly the, the way in which revenue is collected and then doled out, leads you to a point where tr Treasury collects 94% of the revenues that are raised by the, by the UK, in the UK, by the public sector. The other 6% is raised by, largely by local authorities, but that's for ring fence for, for some very specific purposes, and I think most people are probably aware of the extent to which local authorities are, are suffering financial strain in any case. Um, and therefore, the, the question, where does that money come from? I think at the moment, I, I can only really see one answer. Now, there, there are some things you can do around the peripheries to, to help raise um, additional funding um, to support the strategic transport plan. Um, so it was mentioned in one of the sessions earlier that there are retail opportunities around railway stations, for instance. But if you look at the scale of the expenditure that is required um, to actually m kind of move the dial in the north, um, and if you look at the nature of s uh, quite a lot of the, the investments that we have in our investment pipeline, so I, I would point to the number of road schemes that are in there for which there are no obvious um, revenue raising opportunities. Um, and and if you actually, if you look at, at, at when there are revenue-raising opportunities, the costs that, that, that local authorities have to bear associated with those, so I'm talking about housing schemes, for instance, where they come with a need to build primary schools and access roads and, and health centres and, and the rest. It is really something, I mean, it's something we, we've looked into in quite a lot of detail, but I think overall, if, if this is going to be funded in any meaningful way in the near future, then it will need to be funded by central government. Charlie, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I'd, I'd just really improve on those remarks really by just saying that I think we need to focus on on three things in terms of our, our in terms of our conversation as the North. From my perspective, we need to make sure that we demonstrate that we are credible. We need to demonstrate that we are capable, and in turn, the government then needs to give us that certainty. So, in terms of Credible, I think what we need to ask for has got to be realistic. It's got to be strategic and it's actually, it's got to take people with us. So I, I made a note here, do not mention anything parochial for Lancashire. So in Skelmersdale, <laughs> uh, we've, we, um, uh, we, we, we announced yesterday, we're gonna, uh, last week, sorry, where we pushed the, the, the business case for a new rail link uh, linking Liverpool, Manchester, and Skem. And one of the biggest thing, feedbacks we got was, oh, we've heard it all before. 
because it is just another business case. It's not concrete on the ground shovel. So we've got to make sure that what we're telling, what, what we're asking government has got to be credible and it's got to make sure that we have the, the, the people have got to be with us all the way. Capacity, I think, is really important. We've got to make sure that we actually are capable of delivering these. And I think that Tracy Brabin said it in her opening remarks very well. Um, we've got to demonstrate we can deliver. Um, there is a, there's a brain drain happening, and I don't think that this is something that, that we are quite aware of. Um, do not mention anything parochial. In Lancashire, we've uh, got the Preston Western Distributor Link Road, which is being built at the moment. It's like a new Preston bypass, the other side of the M6. And the guy who is leading that project, fantastic, fantastic officer of the County Council. And this is his, this is his swan song. This is his my way. And he, his first project for us was building the M65. And the people who he learned how to build roads from built the M6. And that was the first motorway in the country. And he's going after this project. And I think it's that brain drain. And actually, do we have the, the, organi the institutional kind of capacity to be able to deliver on major infrastructure projects in the north? Um, but the, so are we credible? Are we capable? The answer is obviously and clearly yes. And when we can combine those two, then we can go to government really and say, right, what we need is the certainty. We need long-term, we need long-term planning. We need a long-term financial solution. So whatever uh, guise it comes in, as, as, as you say, Ian, it's not, we shouldn't really be talking about financing, it should be funding uh, the way in which we, we, we fund transport in the north um, it's got to be it's got to be long term that for me is the key I've got a couple of innovations I'd like to see and you say that it's peripheral uh, it's, it's uh, having a it's like it's like having a paper round to pay off the mortgage um, and but I think we should think about how do we be how are we self-sustainable um, and I like the idea of that's actually focusing on the fact that we need to open up new markets of passengers and that's the best way I think for us to be self-sustainable is actually get more money from passengers. The best way to do that is make sure that passengers are using the services that they want. So we've got to make sure that we are market driven in the way in which we, we, we design these services. I really like the idea of actually uh, reintroducing to people who've never got on trains or don't want to get on trains. I think we should have a Northern Rail card and every person in the North gets a rail card and they've got one prepaid journey on it every year, a return journey. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't think about it. Um, but in, 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 in conclusion, sorry for my remarks, I'd just like to say that, that the key for me is the fact that the government, when it is making these decisions, it can't be done based on just a BCR, a financial algorithm because when, when the North asks for something using a financial algorithm based in London, computer says no. And computer, computer doesn't just say no once, it says it no time and time again, and that cannot be the way in which we deliver. Um, so show that we're credible, show that we're capable, and we'll get to certainty, so my, my comments. So touching on what Charlie said, Sir Roger Marsh, why do you think the North has historically struggled to maintain that same level of investment as other areas over previous decades? Yeah. Well, that is a very big and difficult question. I think, I think one of the challenges which I believe we've overcome as a community of, of like-minded Northerners, whether we hail from the North or not, but perhaps live and work here now, is is seeing ourselves not as a problem, but as a solution. And I'd like to think, whether it's the private sector, the public sector, whether it's LEP chairs like me locally, MP11, or otherwise, that we are beginning to speak with one voice. It's not about what we haven't had, because that's past tense. It's actually what we offer. And I think people forget, uh, whilst transport is clearly very important, it's one of the ingredients that the prize ultimately and I say this with, with my own personal conviction is that within a reasonable time frame 
question mark, what is that? That we progressively uh, moved away from deprivation and poverty being every day of the week for the vast majority of the 16 million plus people that live in the north, number one. But, but to achieve that, we also, with the right level of, of, of investment against the offers we make as a community and the asks of them can be calibrated, progressively a north of, I think you use the word, Charlie, we are actually self-financing as, as, as an economy, rather than the pre-pandemic uh, monthly deficit of at least a billion pounds a month for underperformance. And I remember a, a few years ago, the Norm Health Science Alliance published a report about health for wealth. And one of the challenges of low productivity in the North was due to the health of the working and other populations. And so I think for me, the, the, the transport piece is part of an, of an important ingredient to the recipe that delivers a net contributing north rather than continually dependent north, which in turn over time, and my own time scale would be, it'll, it won't be within a decade, but it should be well within two, um, where we've progressively moved the dial on positively. And I think for us to make the case, and again, Charlie's right, we want the computer to say, let's just think about this. Let's just think about it. And, and I'm like you, I don't want to be parochial, but let me illustrate my point here in West Yorkshire. Yes, the computer might look at a city like Bradford with all of its economic challenges, the youngest city in the country, massively diverse, and say, why would you put a city centre station in that city? As compared to, actually, what might you do in terms of unleashing its economic potential for generations to come? And it's about having that bigger vision. So for me, linking <coughs> all that we're doing in this room and today and beyond with the wider plan for growth and the three, the three pillars and the three objectives, all of which we, I think, could ascribe to, and keep making the case not for what we haven't had, but what we what we offer. We offer something extraordinary to UK PLC, and but that's why some of the asks are quite sizable. Then the question is, how do you match offer and ask? And Emma, why do you think it's so important to see this sustained pipeline of investment in infrastructure? I think it's absolutely fundamental that we've got a pipeline. And um, speaking on behalf of the institution of civil engineers, um, and we've, you know, we have companies who want to take on staff, but a lot of it is project based. So you don't take on staff unless you've got work. Um, you know, fundamentally, um, and and we have such an opportunity to really grow our skills base to drive up that productivity um, uh, around the, the construction industry um, and, and the, the north and the country as a whole. Um, but you can't do it without certainty. And, and we know that nothing's certain in this life. And I think the last 18 months particularly has shown us that. Um, but actually, during that period, the construction industry has not paused in the same way that it does with recessions in the past, or has done with recessions in the past. Um, we are in a, a, a different situation, but at the same time, we've not been able to plan in advance for the kind of um, rhetoric that we're getting from government about building back better, but in a, in a sustainable net zero way, how do we retrofit our industries and our homes in terms of um, energy efficiency? So the, there is demand out there. Um, we need to ensure that our skills system can support that. Um, but without the pipeline of work, um, actually, that stalls. Um, and we can't deliver in the most effective, most cost-effective way um, and, and, you know, we don't move forward. So I guess the big question is, what are the main challenges that you see to getting that right level of investment, not just for our, our major cities, but also for our towns and our rural areas as well? If I can open that up. Well, I mean, I think there's a, there's a few challenges in there. Um, I mean, there's a capacity challenge. Um, there is a, we, you've got to make the case 
first first up. So, you, so um, Charlie was talking about computer saying no. I think the changes to the green book means that the computer the, the computer might say yes more often. But then that leaves you with another set of decisions decisions to make because you've got more things you could you could potentially do that would be green book compliant. Um, I think you've you have got to have the capacity within either local authorities or, or regional bodies to develop schemes to get them capable of being invested by, by government. Um, you've got to prove that they, they do what they say they're going to do, which I think some of the work Transport for the North has done has been quite important in that in terms of developing our analysis tools. Um, and then you've got to have a supply chain to actually build them, which Emma was just referring to, to then. So there's a, there's a whole series of, of things that we need to be able to do. And, and being realistic, you know, I talked about 2.3 billion a year earlier. I mean, that's just the number in the strategic transport plan divided by the number of years. I mean, the reality is that's not next year or the year after because we've got to build our build and prove the, you know, the ways of working, the systems, the capability to do that. But that will only happen if you get some kind of multi-year commitment from government to actually actually commit to an investment pipeline, in my view. I think what one of the biggest challenges as well is rising costs. I think, uh, did you know that the price of tomatoes has tripled in a year? <laughs> and, you know, and, and you don't build railways to get tomatoes. Um, but, you know, the problem, the problem that we've got is that there is a huge, I think that's the biggest challenge coming down the line for us, is we're costing projects five years ago, asking for the money now, and it's going to be, it's going to be five years where we deliver it and I think that's the big problem is there's going to be a funding gap and who meets that if the government only gives us 200 million pound per project does the county council meet that who 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 pays for that so I think that is a major challenge that again just needs to be in people's minds I guess the inconvenient truth is kind of where we are fiscally as a country um, we can't afford to and we can't afford not to. It's how to strike the right balance between the priorities, uh, the obvious ones um, for a democratic society and the taxing, tax raising implications. But I think there's also something else that somehow in my own mind as a non-politician, non-officer, just as a citizen, I can't quite square the notion of devolution and places how to being strike given the right balance you know, between being given the, the priorities some of the and some of the powers powers to ones, be in charge of um, their own destiny. The democratic society. When I say a place, I mean the North and as a whole, the including the metro as well as tax raising implications. The rural and coastal, on the one hand, um, but based on templated approaches from the centre, almost like centre knows best, and how to perhaps break that apart and say, do you know what? Whether you're elected for Whitehall, uh, sorry, uh, Westminster, sorry, elected locally or just a citizen, we all pay taxes. We all want to see the money spent well. And actually, um, we in this room, um, and I'm not going to talk about any particular organisations, have demonstrated how well we uh, steward public money. So if actually we've already demonstrated we can do it well and as a, as a community can healthily compete, you, you're right, everybody wants to protect their own, but do it in a, a healthy way as well as collaborate to, to know an advantage such that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, then let's get on with it. Um, there may be some trade-offs and we may have to just face those. For example, um, do I think HS2 and Northern Powers Rail are both essential together with the local connectivity? Yes. If we have to think about the time frames in a different way, well, let's have that conversation rather than leave any uncertainty in the air. That's, that's my view. And I think a lot of business people say, actually, we are, to your point, how do we make longer term investments if we're going to be limited to some of the yings and yangs of political cycles, wherever it is those yings and yangs come from. And I don't make that as a, as a criticism or a complaint, just as an observation in a constructive way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think synergy is fundamental. Um, 
the fact that there are so many people at this conference today means that I think people really want to, to make that progress. Um, the issue is, what are the barriers in the way? Um, and, and how do we get over those barriers? I think we do need to collaborate, not just as LEPs or local authorities or Transport for the North, but, but right across the board from a, a business perspective and how do we make that engagement be really meaningful um, to the people who hold the purse strings and the powers um, that they can, they can devolve um, to the region or the super region um, that does have the talent, does have the ambition, um, does have the, some of the capability um, to actually deliver um, and we have a, a, a large proportion of the population of England. Um, we have a lot of very, very strong universities um, with the, the capabilities that they have. We lead the world in lots of different things. Um, and yet, we still have that productivity gap. We still have those challenges. Um, so we, we need that um, leap of faith, if you like, from from central government to say, okay, um, you know, you say you've, you've got a plan, the plan looks good, we have the data that backs it up, um, let's deliver it. So touching back on what you said, Roger, about devolution in particular, do you think that devolution would help to deliver better levels of investment for the North? I'm a complete believer in the devolution model. Um, but also a model that uh, helps, particularly those elected, um, take some of the risks that, uh, and recognise not everything works perfectly. Obviously, you don't go out there to, for everything to fail, but to be able to take some of the risks and, and don't feel un uncomfortable about it, because um, there are there are enormous prizes to be secured. And Emma's just touched on, you know, the university. You know, I. I been in dialogue and people saying, well, we're going to put another £10 billion pounds per annum by 2027 into research and development, you know, for, for England. And I said, well, no, it's not another £10 billion for England. It's actually four initially to the north to make good on the gap that currently exists, the so-called missing four billion that Professor Richard Jones has, uh, has, has set out, and then six billion to be perhaps reprofiled. And sometimes having these conversations makes people stop and think. Uh, I, I think, as I say, the devolution model, um, in my part of the world, it's, it's, it's only relatively new. We've only had a mayor for 130 or more days. Um, in other places, it's much more developed. But actually, we've already demonstrated how, how we can you know, deliver what would appear at the outset extraordinary returns, but actually you know, really useful returns for the taxpayer pound. And, and I think it, it comes back to that word. We're all in this together, to use that phraseology. Uh, why do we need to be trusted to make our place better, not only for the people up here, wherever, wherever up here is, but actually for the nation? It, 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 I find it quite incredulous that um, there's still this, having to still make this argument. Um, uh, but, but if we continue, as I say, not to be fragmented as a family of the North, uh, resolute in supporting each other and presenting those, as I said, where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts um, agenda, then hopefully at least it will be looked at favourably when it comes to the allocation of scarce resources. And also to keep making the case, we don't want a poor South either. We just want the South to be able to keep more of what it generates to sort out its challenges, does it? It's not just Poverty isn't just limited to the north, it's, it's everywhere. Rather than perhaps some of what's floating around now says, OK, what will happen is if the north get more out of the comprehensive spending, somehow that means it's to the expense of the south. We must, we must somehow throttle that argument because that may be an argument that's used uh, really to nobody's advantage. If I could just, just add really, which is that there's almost different types of devolution happening. There's, there's a political devolution and a financial one, and I don't think they're, they're at the same pace. And I think 
that's something that I'd really like to see is make sure that if you're going to give genu if you genuinely want to give power to communities, give them the budget to do so. Because um, that's that's something. That, if anything, I've actually think that we've regressed that in the last couple of years. Um, I think that the pots of money that we can apply for, we can apply for more pots of money um, as an organisation such as County Council. Um, but the caveats and the hoops you have to jump through, and the, the, the it's almost narrower and narrower in what you can actually spend that money on. So it's all well and good having this this money that is available and accessible, uh, but if it doesn't meet narrow criteria, then you're not going to get it. And um, I don't know if that's the evolution at all. Ian, do you want to jump in? No, I think I'm, I'm not sure I've got, got much to add to that, actually. I, th I think devolution can mean all sorts of different things. Um, and I think unless there is some control over financial decision making or resource allocation, then you've potentially got powers, but without any real ability to follow through. So I would agree with what Charlie said. So we've heard a lot in recent months, and it feels like years actually, about levelling up. And it was only this week that the government's announced that it's going to be naming a ministry in particular about levelling up. So levelling up feels like such a fluffy term, doesn't it? In terms of what would success actually look like for you in terms of the levelling up agenda? And most important, what do we need to do as a region to secure that investment for the North to level up? <laughs> Again, um, uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, and I don't paint this picture out of crassness. Uh, for, for me, levelling up is making sure that somebody in the centre just doesn't have a template that says that what it looks like, and we rule it out everywhere. You know, we're, we're not Tesco, uh, nothing wrong with Tesco or any of the other, you know, formats where it's the same everywhere you are in the country. We need to see levelling up. As, as something of a pick and mix where certain places will need certain things um, which may be a really big bag of pick and mix and other places might not only need smaller things uh, and to one of Charlie's points not have these unhealthy competitions with places uh, for funding that's then prescribed what you spend it on rather than what you've determined is needed for those communities whether it be coastal rural metro or otherwise um, and I think the fact that I think it's been announced today that Andy Haldane the former chief economist of the Bank of England is going to head up a task force these are not my words they're the words of the independent I think that said you know actually leveling up's language but there's what is it behind it and we actually need to get some substance behind actually what's the prize from it and if the prize going back to my point is that over a decade or two albeit that's quite a long period of time, is the North becomes self-sufficient self economically because it's had this, this and this to meet our offers, then that's what levelling up should look like. It may be, di and it may be different in Lancashire as compared to here in West Yorkshire or actually on the North East Coast. But it's, it's having that flexibility. Um, there is no right, and indeed there is no wrong answer, but actually places, coming back to the devolution model, saying this is what we think, Trust us, give us the tools, judge us by the results. Even Tesco don't ask people to Well, you get, you get my point. Yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. I just, I, I'll tell a little quick story. So, I, so I'm, I'm a county councillor for Morecambe, which is where I represent. And you're all very welcome to come to the glorious <laughs> sunny town of Morecambe anytime you like. And at the moment, we're in the news quite a lot because there's going to be the uh, project, the new Eden project have decided that Morecambe is where they want to build the Northern Eden project and uh, as you can probably tell from my accent not naturally from Morecambe I grew up in South London and for me levelling up can be described in a very simple fact I went to a normal primary school and my first school trip I went to was to the Natural History Museum in the centre of London the kids who I represent in Morecambe, the first school trip they do is they go to the canal and count frogs. That's the difference. That, for me, is the potential of levelling up, is actually how can we really genuinely have an equitable opportunity for people, for every person in this country. And I was, 
so extremely motivated when, when Boris uh, became the Prime Minister and he made that his thing. And I think that levelling up is, I think, what this country should be defined on in this decade. And um, I don't think the levelling up fund does that. And the answer to the previous question about narrow funds, levelling up, it's so hard to bid for the money for the levelling up fund. Um, but as a political identity and ideology, I think it's something that Transport for the North and all of us in this room should really buy into that, yeah, it's time to level up. It's time to get out of the canal. Um, we all need an Eden project. And, and, but we do need to, we need to have things that we aspire to and, and, and give everyone that chance in life to make the best of it. So I, I love levelling up. And I think that it's up down to us to make sure it happens. Ian, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I'm in it.
can the industry as a whole help you to lobby for changes in the way that funding is allocated, but also how schemes are procured? Perhaps I'll, I'll just start us off. Thank you, Ginny. I, hope, I don't know whether you managed to get to the carriage of trees, but if you didn't, <laughs> let, let, me, let, oh, let, let, me, let me know. Um, and I'm also proud that Barford Beach are doing the East Leeds Orbital route, which is something I've personally bid for in terms of um, uh, uh, that, that opening up the joined up thinking that said this is just not a transport project, this is an economic project, this is a housing project, and it's just for just being a side boy and it goes around the e east of Leeds to avoid the centre linking a number of uh, economic areas that are ripe for development as well as potentially releasing nearly 7,500 houses much needed in our part of the world. Um, I think it's about making the, the case, as I've just said, to illustrate this is just not a road, this is not just about a road, this is about a road routing that's going to enable a number of things to happen um, uh, with, with, with the plans already in place, as well as the various things that, that exist. And for me, uh, I often find myself saying, we know what the jigsaw puzzle picture is that we want economically and socially in this part of the country, which is the one I spend most of my time involved with. Show me how this is an important piece in that, rather than just an ingredient that seems to fit the narrative of the moment, rather than, to Ian's point, the long-term solution that we're all trying to get to. There's a lot that, that can be done. I think the private sector has um, a very big voice uh, that does get listened to. Um, and it's about that collaboration, making sure that we're not just talking about, as, as Rog just said, this project, but it's about the wider value, isn't it? Uh, and, and particularly the social value, um, you know, housing and access to health and, and education opportunities um, you know that's something that as ICE we we try to do a lot in terms of making sure that clients can be uh, broader in their thinking um, to bring the contractors in to talk earlier um, to really try and uh, drive the the best value and the sharing of the risk as well because that's a that's a massive issue for the industry um, at a much earlier point, and then we we stand to be able to address some of those issues that Charlie pointed out, that you price up a job five years ago, and look, the world changes, and so funnily enough, so does the price. Um, so, I, you know, th there's quite a lot that that is going on, but I think we just need to join it together a bit more. Thank you. As Hans wondered from Warrington, um, I've, I've picked up some of the, the points people were making. I think the, the bids of pots of money uh, <laughs> keeps coming up, but uh, is this not being used too often now and too much? Is a bidding for pots of money, you get a, a pick and mix solution, and I think um, th that that's the sort of thing we're looking for, but to, uh, they're not looking for. Don't we need some more joined up thinking and long term solutions as to some of the issues we've got, not only in the North but in the, but in the nation? And what we've worked out is, is a, a failed bid costs just as much as, as a successful bid. And when you have pots of money and you have eight comp competitors against the same pot of money, one winner and seven losers, how much wasted resources, money, and time of officers is actually being wasted in, in, in this bidding way? And I think we're going too far down the line of everything is. Uh, there's a pot of money there, you can all bid for it, and that's the solution. Well, actually, you've got seven unfulfilled solutions, uh, problems not, not solved for every one you solve. I, can I just say, I, I actually raised this as an issue when I first uh, interacted with Transport for the North, and we pay, for every different levelling up fund bid or whatever bid we put, put, we put forward, there is always that part of the, the consultant's work, which is the, what's the economic picture of Lancashire look like and stuff. And, Transport for North basically said to us, you know, that we have huge amounts of data that we'll be able to, to, to give you access to, to be able to help you in delivering those bids. And I thought that's such a really collaborative and constructive and real positive of Transport for the North. 
Um, I think it's, and I was so impressed with that um, when I when I first come into the role. So I would just say that actually there are people that can help with that, and I think Transport of the North have got a massive role to play, and if I, I found that really really useful to them, I would like to publicly thank Transport of the North for that because it's brilliant. And I think probably what this discussion has led us to is that you know that collaboration is absolutely key and crucial, really to secure that investment at the heart of almost unleashing the potential of the North, isn't it? So thank you very much for the panel, um, and thank you all. I think we're now going into our closing session, um, and it's back down to the Queen's Ballroom, um, following the one-way system. <laughs>